made publicly available. Um, the MBTA uh, team has prepared short sets of mini presentations tonight on several of our bus related initiatives under the Better Bus Project. Following those mini presentations, we'll split into breakout sessions where we can have further in-depth conversations about all of the projects and also be able to answer any specific questions that you may have. However, before we get started, I would like to go over a few meeting controls to make sure everyone is comfortable using Zoom. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we will have live trans transcription for tonight's meeting. Please press the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to get those started. Next slide, please. Uh, if at any point during the meeting you're having any technical questions about Zoom or accessibility features for tonight's meeting, please use the chat feature and you should be able to chat tech support, uh, which should be the, the, top, um, the top or the second to the top uh, in, your, in your chat box. Um, and so please feel free to use that feature to get any questions you might have answered. And next slide, please. On uh, tonight's call, we are joined by our general manager, Steve Poftak, um, our deputy director of community engagement, who's acting also as our tech support, Anthony Thomas, uh, and Michaela Comas, our community liaison for, uh, for community engagement, part of, excuse me, as part of the community engagement team. I'd also like to appreciate the many staff from the MBTA and MassDOT who are here with us this evening and who are deeply passionate about bettering our entire bus system. Um, I'm going to remind all of our presenters uh, when you are not speaking to leave your cameras off so that we can make sure we have the right presenter pinned at any time. Lastly, I'd like to acknowledge the numerous public officials who have uh, chosen to spend their evening with us tonight. Welcome and we're glad you are here. To get us started at this point, I would like to welcome our general manager, Steve Poftak, uh, for some opening remarks. Great, thanks, Lindsay. Um, thanks to everyone at the MBTA and MassDOT um, who's joining and is gonna have the opportunity to interact tonight. And I guess most of all, thank you to all of you um, who have chosen to participate, participate, all of our stakeholders, all of our community members. It is, uh, it is really exciting to see how many people have turned out for this and how many people care uh, so deeply about bus. If we could go to the next slide, you know, this whole sort of the wrapper around this whole process is the MBTA wants to make bus better for its riders. Uh, I know that's probably simple and self-evident, but I, I think it's, it's important for us to talk about our good intent here. We really want to make bus better. We wanted to make bus better before the pandemic. If the pandemic has brought home anything to us, it is that uh, you know bus ridership has not only been the most durable, it has been the, the ridership that has come back the most. We're at about 55 to 60% ridership on bus, which is far and away, uh, far and away the highest out of the major modes of transportation. Through the years, as we've talked to our riders about bus, we've consistently heard um, they want faster trips, they want more reliable trips, and the Better Bus Project is a way to combine a number of different initiatives, but all focused on improving the bus experience for riders. And that experience has a bunch of different components. If we could go to the next slide, it is about providing you as the rider the information you need real-time information wherever possible. It's providing amenities around the bus, bus shelters, stops, sidewalks that are comfortable, safe, and accessible. And then it's also about the service itself, uh, improving frequency, improving trip quality, making it easy for you. Uh, it, however you come to the bus, if you come with uh, a stroller, a wheeled mobility device, or or something else that you can you can access the bus and also depending on where your journey takes you it's easy to understand how that how the bus you're on connects to the rest of the journey so as we you know as we look at all these fundamentals of service the way that we aim to execute on this if we go to the next slide is a number of different projects 
that we have, and you're going to hear from a number of the owners of these projects tonight. Um, there's a, you know, you, I won't bother reading to you the stack here on the, on the left of, of your screen, but you can see the different programs that are underway. These are all really, uh, you know, these are all really important programs. They obviously have a ton of interdependence. Uh, the one that I will choose to focus on that we'll talk about a little bit tonight is bus network redesign. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to see so many people are here tonight because I think it's important uh, that we start to get the word out um, about how bus network redesign is going to be a heavy lift. It's going to be changed but it will fundamentally improve the network and it will complement all these other programs that we have underway. We really view this as a once in a generation opportunity to make an order of magnitude improvement in bus service here at the MBTA. So, uh, you know, I, we want to hear your feedback tonight. We want to work with various communities to make sure that we're doing the right level of improvements in the right places. And with that, I will uh, offer my thanks to all of you for riding with us, offer my thanks to the MBTA staff for joining tonight, and I will pass it back to Lindsay, and I will, um, I will be here for the meeting, but I will uh, follow instructions and turn off my video. So back to you, Lindsay. Thank, thank you very much, Steve. Um, uh, if we can go to the next slide. We have nine short presentations for you tonight on a lot of really exciting topics. Uh, the first one to get us get us started here is on that topic, of particularly of bus network redesign. Uh, Carolyn Vanessa is the manager of transit planning for um, MassDOT's Office of Transportation Planning. And Caroline, please uh, take us away. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. It's great to see this picture of a cool uh, winter night on this very hot day. Um, Next slide, please, Michaela. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna try to keep this to five minutes, but looking forward to taking more questions during the breakout groups later. Um, bus network redesign, as the general manager so eloquently said, is really a once in a lifetime opportunity to reimagine how the MBTA can better reflect the travel needs of the region and create a better experience for current and future riders. Next slide. So when I say bus network redesign, what does that actually mean? So there's a lot of things that you can do to the bus network. We can implement transit priority. We can implement um, more accessible bus stops. Bus network redesign is really focused on the service overall. And it's really just generally serving the neighborhoods and streets, but connecting them in different ways to make it work that's better for our riders. Next slide. And what can you expect from this project particularly? First and foremost, we're really trying to create a more equitable network that better serves our transit critical populations. When I use that word, I mean specifically low income population, communities of color, seniors, people with, and people with disabilities. Um, we also wanna create a network that's simpler and easier to understand. Our network is very complex and hard to explain to you know, someone kind of uh, just trying to, to newly uh, use the network and we want to make it easier for everyone. We also want to um, provide more service in busy neighborhoods, more service where you work or study, and we also want to really provide um, more all day service with buses in the day, evening and weekends. We've really seen the need to improve off peak service um, throughout the pandemic to especially get um, essential workers to their jobs. Next slide. So just in terms of timeline, um, we have recently completed a survey where we got a thousand responses where we asked the question, where do people need to go and what makes transit a good option to get them there? Um, and we are kind of continuing that discussion this fall. We're planning for teams and in uh, the kind of early winter in early spring, we will have a draft network map uh, that we will be doing very extensive engagement around. Um, and then based on all of the input, responding to that and having um, you know, a final network map that we will bring to uh, begin thinking about implementation in the summer. Next slide. 
In terms of implementation, once we actually have the draft network map and um, adopted and we commit to full implementation, that's in 2022. There's a lot of other things that need to happen in the way of infrastructure, some of which will um, be talked about tonight. So transit priority, bus stop in installation, busway modifications, and signage are all critical to implementing the bus network redesign and providing the levels of service that we're talking about here. Um, when we're talking about rolling out the service, um, we are planning for three to five phases of implementation for the bus network design and will potentially be rolled out by geography. Um, implementation timing will depend on the structure of the network, staff, and public outreach capacity, and the especially the ability to implement bus priority. There's a lot of places where we know we wanna improve connectivity, but in order to do that, we really need the infrastructure to provide the customer experience that we want. All right, I think that's it for me. Lindsay, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks so very much, uh, Caroline. Lots of exciting things happening there. And uh, up next, to talk about service planning and particularly some fall service changes, I'd like to welcome uh, Melissa Doulet, who is our Senior Director of Service Planning in the Planning and Schedule Department. Melissa, welcome. Thanks for the introduction, Lindsay. I'm here to speak with you about our upcoming fall service changes. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our plan to continue bringing back service. As you know, during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, the MBTA reduced service in line with decreased ridership and revenue. We also reallocated service to different parts of the system uh, to maintain quality service for transit critical populations. What that means in some areas, especially uh, low income areas, minority areas, we found that there were a lot more people who were continuing to work in person. And as we were going through the pandemic with uh, different uh, physical distancing requirements. Uh, we actually did a lot of reallocation of services and we were able to do that because there are some areas where there was a lot more work from home activity. <clears throat> so now as the economy is reopening, travel is increasing, we're bringing back service in different ways to best accommodate new travel patterns as some riders are returning to in-person work, school and other travel. Next slide. These are specifically the fall 2021 bus service changes. These take effect with the start of our uh, fall period that starts this Sunday, August 29th. Uh, with these changes, we will be up to running about 93% of our pre-COVID bus service hours. But again, those aren't necessarily uh, hours that are operating on the same network that we ran pre-COVID because there've been a number of changes and reallocations that I mentioned. The biggest, most notable, noticeable changes that you'll see is that we're restoring some routes that have had their schedules uh, significantly impacted uh, in the case of the Route 67, that's our uh, Turkey Hill service in Arlington. It's been running uh, peak periods only with suspended midday service. And that midday service is going to get restored starting next week. Similarly, the Route 351 is a commuter-oriented service that hasn't been running for most of the last uh, year, and a, year and a half. Uh, and that will be restored. So that is commuter-oriented service that takes people to office parks in Burlington, Bedford, and Billerica. Though so if uh, you are uh, heading to those notes areas, please note that the service has changed very significantly. Instead of being an express service uh, with a different fare type uh, that takes people all the way to Alewife, it will be instead a uh, local service that uh, connects to the 350 at Third Avenue in Burlington, uh, right over by the Wegmans. And it will uh, actually run a little bit more frequently, but it forces that uh, transfer connection. So be sure to check a schedule. Um, we are uh, doing coordinated time transfers uh, with the 350. So that should be, uh, even though it's a transfer, it should be a good transfer. Route 428, that's our Oakland Vale bus. Uh, that's commuter oriented, takes people into uh, Boston. We'll be coming back. Route 451, that's uh, North Beverly. Uh, we'll be back during rush hours. 456 is actually a midday route that connects to Highland Ave in Salem uh, over to Central Square Lane. And the 505 is the express bus from Waltham to downtown, uh, which will be restored. So those are the biggest, uh, most noticeable changes of services that will be uh, coming back, uh, starting with the fall. We also have a number of routes that have increased frequency. Uh, I won't go through this whole list, uh, just some highlights. The 52 in particular, was operating a very skeletal service with uh, only one bus uh, every 90 minutes or so, and that'll be back to every 30 minutes, uh, which should be a big boon to 
uh, any of the folks were using that to get to a number of um, schools in uh, Newton in particular. I know there's a middle school and some other uh, schools that uh, you see quite a bit of the Route 52's travel is specifically for those schools. Uh, the routes 95, 100, and 101 are all sort of a family of frequency improvements. And these are sort of filling in because we are not in a position to restore the 325 and 326 just yet. But with uh, some of those resources, we were able to uh, improve the frequency of the nearby local bus services so that people can connect to the Orange Line with service that's you know every 15 minutes or better uh, usually and uh, still be able to get into downtown. And then also uh, the 354 is sort of doing double duty. So it uh, has, uh, since COVID, it's added a stop in Medford Square. So um, that will uh, help to uh, serve some of the folks who uh, were former 326 users. And then also the 354 is uh, by its own right, um, bringing folks from uh, Burlington and Woburn. It's a combination uh, route still uh, serving both the former 352 territory and the regular 354 territory. Uh, and that'll be improving its frequency from about every 40 minutes uh, to every 20 or 25 minutes. We also have improved frequency on the 501 for some of our uh, downtown oriented uh, express commuters from like uh, Brighton Center and the SL4 will see improvements as well. Uh, and then one other change that I'd like to highlight, the 75 is seeing a uh, route and frequency change. What it, what's actually happening is that the 72, which has been suspended, uh, that's our Aberdeen Ave service that uh, continues into Harvard uh, via Huron Ave. Uh, it's been suspended during COVID, but it'll be restored, which means uh, it'll be restored as a variation of the 75. So uh, its route number is changing, but it's pretty much doing the same thing that it did before, which means that here and Ave will now see about 15 minute service instead of every 30 minute service. So this is just a snapshot of some of the biggest bus changes that we have. Uh, you can read about more of these changes at mbta.com slash service changes. And you can also read about some of our other upcoming changes to the rapid transit, commuter rail, and other schedule changes there. Thank you much. Thanks so very much, uh, Melissa, for being with us this evening and explaining all those changes. Uh, next, taking a slightly different tack on this, uh, building a better bus dispatch app. Uh, unless the unless dispatchers know where the buses need to go, uh, we we have problems. And I have a uh, we have Ashley Molina here to talk about Skate. Uh, she is the project manager on bus technology with our customer technology division. Ashley, go ahead, take it away. Hello. Um, all righty. Next slide, please. So uh, before I started working at the T, I expected bus service to be a lot more automated. Um, I now know that it is a profoundly human system that heavily relies upon quick decision making, countless phone calls, a lot of papers, and just externalities like beyond our control. Click, please. Uh, but what do you need uh, to run bus service? Uh, buses, we have around 800 on the road at peak times. Bus operators, we have over 1,000 of them. And then all those bus operators uh, must have buses to drive. They need to start at the right place and at the right time. They need to take bus, um, they need to take breaks and have days off. And if there's traffic, uh, we need to adjust. Uh, so who's behind this? Uh, it's a lot of people doing different types of jobs. And what do they have to work with? Click please. Uh, well, they used to have this uh, big tablet with a clunky piece of software, click, and they have phones, radios, and piles of paper. Uh, so what bus operation staff really need is connective tissue. They need a way uh, to be sharing information in real time because paper alone isn't going to do it. And so we really wanted to equip bus officials to have the most up-to-date information so they, get, um, so they can get you, our writers, uh, where you're going. Next slide. So rather than accept subpar software from outside vendors, uh, we decided to build it ourselves. Uh, technology, if it's good at one thing, it's at sharing information very quickly to a lot of people. So this is where Skate comes in. Uh, our goal is to make a robust dispatching tool customized to our system uh, that shares information rapidly uh, to everyone working on the same problem because we're an in-house team of researchers, designers, and engineers 
uh, were able to closely collaborate with officials every step of the way and really make it something that they need. And perhaps even more importantly, uh, if we build a single tool that all of bus officials are using, we will have more accurate and more complete data to fuel the bus predictions on mbta.com and your apps such as Google Maps or a transit app. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, so yeah, this is why we build Skate. Um, it's the T's bus dispatching tool available on mobile, tablet, and desktop. What you're seeing on the screen is how it looks on a desktop. Uh, and it currently offers um, on the ground officials bus tracking and operator information that helps them manage and monitor buses in real time. It really allows them to focus on the service and make quick decisions in the event, you know, a bus is out of service or it's stuck in traffic or anything. Like I mentioned, it's a very human system. And so, yeah. And then next slide, please. Uh, so, so far we've launched Skate to over 150 bus officials. About 70% of our bus officials are using Skate every day. And what's really cool is that for decades, bus officials use the same tool. It's Citrix, it's uh, one of, it's the piece of software that I showed in the past slide. And uh, last year we were able to retire uh, those Citrix tablets thanks to Skate. And I really like the, you know, the quotes that you see from bus officials on the slide because they speak to how excited they are to be using Skate despite being so used to the same tool for many years. Uh, so our team, we count that as a monumental success. But separately, um, I mentioned that one of our goals is for Skate to improve predictions for riders. So one of the issues with um, bus service is that when we have to cancel a trip for some reason, say someone is out sick or you know, there's a disruption or anything of the sort, um, that prediction still shows up when you're looking at your app or at mbta.com. So you expect that bus to come. This is really frustrating for riders and we don't want to do this anymore. But Skate is starting to crack the code uh, to this problem. And so far on average, we're able to reduce about 200 of what we call ghost bus predictions per day. Um, Cause you know, they ghost you. <laughs> Um, and so now we're focusing on getting skate um, to different parts of bus operations uh, so they can use the same tool. So we have a holistic and streamlined system. Uh, we were really excited. We just launched our first dispatcher focused feature just last month and we're really excited to see what we can do with this tool. Thank you. Ashley, thank you so very much. It is some really exciting uh, technology and backend uh, to keep this all working. Um, and then we move over to what we need on the streets. Um, if I can welcome Eric Berkman, uh, who is our Director of Transit Priority in our Department of Operations Planning, Scheduling and Strategy, and here to talk about what Transit Priority has been up to and what they have planned for us coming in the future. Thanks, Lindsay. I'm Eric Berkman. I'm the Director of Transit Priority for the T, and you've almost certainly seen a lot of our projects around town. Uh, our group really works on um, bus lane projects, transit signal priority, which is lights that stay green a little bit longer to let the bus get through, and really any other types of changes on the street that help improve the travel time and reliability of the bus network. Um, so this image that you see here, you may, uh, if you've been to Boston's Jamaica Plain, Roxbury area, uh, you may have seen the uh, first center running bus lanes in the region being built on Columbus Ave, which we're really excited about. Uh, this should be opening pretty soon here within the next month or so. Uh, and this, it looks very different as compared to what you see in this image today because we've already installed the canopies and some other platform amenities, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Next slide, please. All right, so in before 2015, uh, since like 2002, we really just had bus lanes on the Silver Line in Boston South End and uh, a little segment on Essex Street up to South Station in Chinatown. Uh, since our group came on uh, in 2018 or so, uh, though there were some projects since 2015, we've really greatly expanded our bus lane network. And I don't think it should be a surprise to anybody on this call because you can really see them as you're out and about around the metro region. So. Uh, as of earlier this summer, we had about 14 uh, lane miles of bus lanes, and you can see this map here, uh, really expanding our communities that we're, that we're providing that enhanced service to, including new communities like Lynn, Malden, um, Everett, and Roslindale were some of the first ones to implement since 2002. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, new partnerships and regional first. So as I mentioned, uh, we have a lot of new partners in this. Uh, so 
top left there, you see an image of a bus in the Sweetser Circle bus lanes. That's the first bus lane in a rotary for our region, which presented a lot of really interesting design uh, challenges that we worked through with MassDOT uh, and the city of Everett, in addition to our own bus operations department. This top right photo is, uh, we did a tour for the mayor here in uh, on, of the Columbus Ave facility earlier in the spring. And we walked along the corridor and pointed out some nice features there, including the uh, enhanced pedestrian crossing, providing some spaces to rest in the middle of the street if you can't make it across the, uh, the corridor in one go. And then we're welcoming new municipalities to our bus lane club. These are municipalities that previously didn't have any bus lane projects and in the past year or so have completed their first project. So that includes the Florence Street project in Malden that was completed last summer. Um, the North Common Street project in Lynn, which was completed earlier this summer, and the Broadway project in Chelsea for uh, the 111 bus, which for many of you is probably your favorite bus route that we have in the system here. Uh, and that was completed, the pilot uh, installation was completed last year with ongoing evaluation now as we decide if the pilot will continue. Uh, next slide, please. So we still have a lot more exciting things to come in the transit party program. So we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're finishing up the Columbus Ave project in the next month or so. Uh, that's a new type of bus lane, including uh, upgraded amenities, some real-time arrival info at the shelters and um, a little bit better shelter for you there. Uh, traffic calming improvements and pedestrian enhancements. Uh, and we recently announced that this facility will be extended up to Ruggles. Um, in 2022 with some funding from the Metropolitan Planning Organization with stakeholder engagement beginning uh, imminently. So we have additional high quality quarters in the works. You may have seen last year, we submitted a build grant uh, for a Blue Hill Ave bus lane project and we've resubmitted that grant again this year. In addition to a grant in partnership with DCR and MassDOT for a Linway project, which is very exciting. Uh, thinking about how our facilities are designed intentionally to help provide a lot of benefits to all the road users, including car drivers, pedestrians, cyclists, uh, and transit users. Um, this is in addition to the slate of quicker build projects that we have, which you may have read about. Many of them are supported by the MassDOT Shared Runner Streets and Spaces program this past summer, and they should be uh, implemented shortly here this fall. And then we're also uh, paying attention to the signals because everybody's going through traffic signals all the time, including our buses thinking through what are the new technologies available for transit signal priority to get us some better results uh, than what we're currently getting today. So all very exciting things going on. Um, next slide, please. All right, great. I'm going to turn it back to Lindsay uh, to turn it over to Doug. Thank, Thank you so, so very much, Eric. Lots of exciting things happening um, for any of our municipal partners on the line tonight. Thank you for all of your efforts to, su to support uh, the work of Eric and his team. Uh, I'd like to next welcome Doug Johnson. He is our uh, transit planner uh, with the uh, MassDOT Office of Trans uh, Transportation Planning, and he's here to talk about uh, next, next ways for the Silver Line. Where, where are we going, Doug? Thanks, Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Um, as Lindsay mentioned, my name is Doug Johnson. I am the project manager for the Silver Line Extension Alternatives Analysis. Next slide, please. Uh, the purpose of this study is to evaluate options for extending Silver Line service from Chelsea into Everett and potentially beyond. So we're looking at all of the different uh, routes a Silver Line extension could take and where that extension could potentially go. The map on the right hand side of the slide here gives you an idea of all of the different routes that we are evaluating. Um, I will provide a link to this map in the breakout session for anyone who wants to take a closer look at it. Um, but this gives you the general sense of where we're looking and what kind of routes we're considering. Next slide. Uh, this slide shows our project schedule. You can see where we are right now, this um, vertical pink line. So we got underway in the fall of 2020. Um, we're about halfway through the study right now. We expect to wrap up our work in the spring of 2022. Um, we've held a couple stakeholder working group meetings with our project stakeholders. We had a public meeting this past April, and we actually have a public meeting coming up at the end of September on September 28th. So I encourage all of you to attend that if you're interested in learning more about this study. Next slide. I mentioned that public meeting will be on September 28th. Ahead of that meeting, we are going to be releasing an online feedback form, which will be available on the project website, mbta.com slash SLX. Um, we want more feedback from folks on those routes on that map that I showed you. We wanna know where people wanna see 
the silver line extended to, where would they take it? Where would it really serve them best if we were to extend that route from Chelsea into Everett and potentially beyond? Um, I look forward to answering any questions that you may have in the breakout session. And I hope to see you at the public meeting on September 28th. Thank you all very much. Uh, Doug, thank you so very much. I know folks who already can't decide which breakout room do you want to go to. You want to see the map or you want to see more transit priority lanes. We can go to the next slide. I'd like to welcome Heather Hume, who is our Director of Transition for the MBTA's Fair Transformation Team to talk about what's next for the future of fares uh, and our fair technology. Thanks, Heather. Uh, good evening, everybody. As Lindsay said, thank you. I'm Heather Hamm, Director of Transition for Fair Transformation. I'm also joined tonight um, by Anna Sangri, who is our equity and sales analyst, um, a network analyst um, as part of our group. Uh, next slide, please. So um, tonight, uh, I've only been limited to three slides and talking about bus, but there are a tremendous amount of uh, efforts that are going on under the uh, umbrella of fair transformation. Over the next four years, you're going to see a lot of changes and a lot of improvements to how uh, individuals and customers pay for fares. Um, but tonight, um, I'm going to try to keep it brief into three slides and talking about how we plan on improving the experience for bus riders. Uh, next slide, please. So. Tonight, um, in particular, we're going to be focusing on um, our expanded uh, fare sales locations. And why that's important to bus riders is what we plan on doing is moving to a, a concept of what we call all door boarding, where uh, bus operators will be able to uh, open all doors um, and individuals be able to board and alight at both the front doors and the back doors. Now, what that means is, is that we also will be removing fare boxes from the vehicle and we'll be moving to what we call a cash off board system. And in order to ensure that everybody still has uh, access and the uh, ways to be able to pay for fares, we are expanding our sales network and th that's what I'll be getting into tonight. So we'll be talking about the, um, the equipment and sort of the guiding principles of uh, this overall pro uh, process and uh, sub project to the fare transformation uh, project overall. Next slide, please. So uh, I think you've heard the common theme through many of the presentations tonight. Everything that we're doing is it's essentially trying to make sure that bus um, is continually accessible and equitable for our riders. It's no, no different for our project. And we're uh, particularly sensitive to the fact that as we move to all door boarding, that we want to ensure that our system is still equitable for those who are unbanked and underbanked and use cash um, to use our system. And so that is our overarching goal. And there are a number of um, guiding principles to ensure that we um, place our, our retail sales, our, our sales network um, equitably across the systems, both geograph uh, geographically based, um, by demographic, um, by ridership. Um, all of these um, points come into account as we think about what we're going to do to be able to expand our sales uh, network. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what does that mean? Um, and so there's kind of a, a multi-pronged approach to what we're doing. And um, when we talk about expanding the sales network, there's um, equipment and then there's relationships and um, partnerships that we are going to be entering into. So as you know, today we have fair vending machines and stations. Those station, those fare vending machines will continue to be there and will function pretty much as you are, are familiar with today. The machines that we'll be introducing in the future will have added um, uh, benefits and functionality. Um, those fare vending machines will actually dispense Charlie cards. You'll be able to reload um, your card as you can today, um, among a number of other features that are sort of tied and coupled to the other parts of the, sa the sales network. Um, the new and sort of exciting piece of all of this is our streetscape fare vending machines. And this is really something that is new um, and will be new to our riders across the system. These uh, fare vending machines will actually be um, actually on the street and mainly targeted at bus stop locations. So if you can imagine getting on at Bellingham Square and being able to um, use a fare vending machine at Bellingham Square, that's what these machines are designed to do. These machines will accept cash. They will dispense Charlie cards. They will have a, a lot of functionality that will allow our riders to continue to use and pay for the system just off board rather than on the vehicle. And then thirdly, we'll be um, expanding our retail sales network greatly. Um, we have about 150 retailers across our system today. We plan on expanding that retail sales network significantly across the system. So we're ensuring that riders 
who are using the bus can use cash um, very easily either by um, one of these streetscape machines or finding a retailer to be able to pay before they board our vehicles. And I look forward to talking more and answering any questions about fare transformation in our breakout room. So uh, Lindsay, I will hand it back to you. Thank you so very much, Heather. Um, and up next, uh, to talk about our bus, our bus fleet, modernizing our bus fleet and our bus facilities that are the home and care for our buses when they're not out on the streets is Scott Hamway. He's our director of bus facility modernization and works in our office of the chief engineer. Thanks for being with us, Scott. Go ahead. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so I guess we can probably just hop into the next uh, next slide. So. Um, yeah, so so we approach our fleet and facilities uh, work as an integrated strategy. Um, we, we don't view them sort of as silos and we're working to advance these four goals across ac across those two um, streams. So one is converting the entire bus fleet to zero emissions technology. In April, we presented a plan uh, to our board to get there by 2040, which makes the T one of the leaders nationally in setting an aggressive electrification target. And unlike some of our peers who have had targets imposed on them by other agencies, we're proud at the MBTA that we've set this one internally. And a, and a big part of delivering the bus experience for our riders that all of my colleagues are presenting on here tonight is, is we need to have a reliable fleet that's in a state of good repair. And in order to do that, we it's really important that we give our uh, maintenance workforce at these facilities uh, modern conditions, environments in which to do their work. All but two of our facilities are a half century old or, or older and all of them are, are in need of significant um, reinvestment. So that's the second key goal. Um, another part of that reliable experience for riders is, is making sure we're maintaining the gains that we uh, won over the last several years and bringing the average age of our fleet, uh, bus fleet down. And to do that, we need to keep purchasing vehicles at, a, at an annual rate of about 80 to 100 buses every year. And we want that fleet to be as uniform as possible. And that'll give us operational flexibility. It'll help reduce maintenance costs. And it's also gonna allow us to manage uh, the wear and tear on vehicles in the fleet across garages. And then um, lastly, even though the COVID has certainly uh, dealt a blow to ridership across the MBTA, as the general manager noted up um, up at the top, you know, the bus has maintained its ridership better than the other modes. And we're optimistic that it'll return to pre-pandemic levels and we want to position ourselves to be able to increase capacity uh, to meet that demand. Um, next slide, please, Michaela. Thanks. So on the facility side, we've kind of started our work focusing our first two modernization efforts are, are a new Quincy facility and a new Arbor Way facility. I'll talk about uh, Quincy first. Um, and Quincy was first because the physical constraints that facility prevent us from, from um, housing and maintaining all but our oldest and, and dirtiest diesel buses there. So Quincy, it, we're really excited about it. it. It's really a critical facility for us. Uh, we're going to size it so that it can accommodate up to 120 buses. That's an increase over today's 86 bus uh, max facility. It's also going to be the first battery electric bus facility, uh, BEB facility for the MBTA, and our first all indoor facility. So we're really excited to have a new modern facility out there that we can show people as we continue to advance this work kind of across uh, the network. And demolition is going to begin on that uh, later this year. Uh, by December. Uh, there's an existing Lowe's Home Improvement Store there that we're going to demo, and that's going to allow us to begin a major construction activity by the middle of next year uh, with the project uh, due to be completed at the end of 2024. Um, so Arbor Way is our next priority, and, and our focus our focus here is really, you know, probably the key reason is this, this facility is really our best opportunity to bring the benefits of electric bus service to, to some of the, to a lot of the routes that serve our low income communities in, in the city of Austin and some of our highest ridership routes as well. And although it's it's one of our newest facilities, it's it's only 20 years old, it was designed to be a temporary facility and it's it's well outlived um, that, that existence. So it's a really critical facility to us for those two reasons. Uh, we're envisioning, as with Quincy, we're envisioning a larger facility at Arbor Way than the one we're replacing. We're envisioning a 200 bus facility and what that's going to allow us to do is is expand that um, electric bus service not just to the to the sort of low income communities and high ridership routes that Arbor Way already serves, uh, but also to ex expand those benefits to other uh, overburdened portions of our of our network. Um, and it's also going to be the first facility to accommodate a mix of our traditional 40 foot buses and our higher capacity 60 foot buses that you see on the 28 or the Silver Line. And what that's going to allow us to do is is to um, introduce those buses on, on, on some of our other overcrowded routes that don't currently have that. So we're really excited about those two features um, of this facility. 
And we're really excited to begin the design effort this fall and begin um, engaging with stakeholders and, and starting a public process this fall. And then uh, lastly, on the facility side, the North, the North Cambridge facility, it's, it's a 28 um, bus facility in Cambridge. It's, it's really too small for us to accommodate a modern uh, facility to our, to our standards on that site. Um, however, the age of that trolley bus fleet, the buses are 17 years old and impending uh, roadway projects that are coming on the, the two routes that, that that facility serves that are going to require those trolley buses to be removed some, from service, you know, really make this an opportune time for the MBTA since we're, since we have a plan to electrify our whole fleet, it, it really gives us an opportunity to bring this um, unique electric fleet uh, into line with our vision of a future system-wide battery electric bus fleet. So we're advancing um, design for retrofit of that facility. Uh, last slide, please, Michaela. Yeah. So and then just switching over to the to the fleet side of the ledger. You know, we're while we're very excited about this transition to electric buses, as, as I noted earlier, it's really important for our customers that we continue to keep our fleet age down and and, and really continue um, to make those regular annual procurements of new buses. Kind of make it like going to the grocery store every week. Just something that we're we're always doing. Um, in order to do that, we're setting up these two parallel um, bus procurement contracts. So one of them is going to allow us um, starting next year to have um, 80 hybrid buses uh, delivered uh, to the MBTA with options to buy up to 100 more each year uh, thereafter for five years. Um, we're also going to have a second contract in place, and that one is going to allow us to buy 35 battery buses uh, the following year in 2023 which is timed um, sort of time to match up with our target date for the North Cambridge retrofit to be done um, with options to also buy 100 BEBs uh, thereafter each year. And that's going to allow us to kind of, you know, toggle back and forth between those two contracts um, and, and buy as many battery buses as our facility, as, as, our, um, as our facility improvements at Quincy, North Cambridge, Arbor Way, and, and the rest of the program allow us to. But in, in, in years where we don't have a facility online to, to accept more BEBs, we can shift back and buy these hybrid buses, which will be the, the cleanest non-electric buses um, in the fleet and, and continue to make sure that our customers have, have new buses um, and reliable buses to provide um, service with. So that's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, I'd like to welcome um, two individuals uh, joining us this evening to talk about the improving overall accessibility uh, for across our bus network. I know we have with us Catherine Quigley, who's our Deputy Director of Strategic Planning for the Office of System-Wide Accessibility, along with our Assistant General Manager for System-Wide Accessibility, Laura Brelsford. And Catherine, I think, are you starting us off? Yes, I am. Welcome. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, next slide. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about the plan for accessible transit infrastructure, which we affectionately call PADI. Uh, the purpose of PADI was to develop a strategic long term barrier removal plan to expand accessibility system wide. So the way we started that was to survey all of the bus stops in the network. And then we took all of those surveys and created a database of all of those meaningful barriers. And then we worked with community stakeholders to develop a repeatable methodology for prioritizing access improvements. And we have since developed a 20-year um, plan for addressing those system-wide. And first, we are starting with our critical stops, so stops that are unsafe or require boarding in the street or would uh, strand somebody on a sidewalk island. Um, and then high priority stops, so a number of barriers present at those stops. Um, we surveyed um, nearly 8,000 stops in 51 towns, which I think it's important to note that 99% of our bus stops are located on municipal property. But the MBTA did commit to address the critical stops with reconstruction or elimination. And we are also we've also identified a number of high priority stops and the paired stops with them, so medium and low. And we have begun doing the work to reconstruct those stops. So you can go to the next slide. You can see on the left side that at the time of the PADI survey, we have a number of stops that were missing. Um, all of the infrastructure needed for compliant bus stops. So the sidewalk, the crossing, the um, essentially the stop was just a sign. 
And on the right, you can see that we have put uh, both the uh, curb ramps on both sides of the street, and we have now a sidewalk with a landing and appropriate infrastructure for people to board and alight. Mm. Um, I'm going, uh, next slide. Um, here we have another example where there was a bench present, but there was no way to access it. Uh, there was a curb, um, which we have now installed a curb ramp and a compliant crossing here as well. Next slide. And here is the Watertown terminal where we had an active bus stop on a roadway median, and we now have provided access to and from that stop, which you can see on the right side where the bus is pulled up. Um, we will continue working on the stops that are identified through this year and next. Uh, and so riders will start to see those benefits out in our bus network. I believe I'm going to next slide. Laura is going to take over now. Uh, good evening, everybody. So Catherine just told you what we're working on in order to prove improve accessibility outside of the bus. And I just want to talk quickly about two initiatives we've been working on to improve the accessibility inside the bus. Um, so one thing we talk about a lot is the fact that no matter how accessible our bus stops are, no, how, no matter how accessible our buses are, the system will not be, cannot be fully accessible and user-friendly unless our operators are well-trained in providing accessible service. So we are really thrilled that uh, just earlier this year, we worked with the Bus Operations Training School to do a full refresh of a full day bus operator training for all new bus, new bus operators. This was developed with feedback from many of our riders with disabilities as well as our operators. Um, and this training, unlike the last training, will include a lot of additional information about uh, assisting riders with disabilities during, during emergencies, which is sort of an emerging um, issue we are working on providing guidance on. So again, this new training will be available to every new operator, as well as, well as any current operators who, um, who would like some additional refresher. Uh, next slide. One innovative thing we are looking at is a, a new system <coughs> on board our buses to make the experience of having your wheelchair or scooter secured while you're on the bus. So for those of us that use wheelchairs, I uh, would tell you that one of the more cumbersome parts of the boarding experience is having your chair or scooter secured. It takes four manual straps and the operator to make sure those are all applied properly. And then when you're ready to get off, all of those straps have to be removed. On 10 of our buses, we are, uh, we are um, piloting this new automated system that actually allows for the rider to apply the securements themselves. So got a quick video here that we want to show you starring one of the members of our, our team. So with this system, you board the bus and instead of facing forward, you back into the current area. You then press a button that's located under the flip up seat. And you can see the automated bar extends. It had secured his chair into place, sort of hugging him into the wall. And then when he pushes the button at the end of his trip, that bar is released and he's able to exit the bus without the operator having to get out of their seat. So we are currently piloting these on um, 
10 of our buses. We are actually in the process of scheduling several open houses where uh, riders can come in, uh, try, try them outside of the routes they're currently on. Um, if anybody has any interest in learning more, you can reach out to us at SWA at MPTA.com. And we're really gonna be listening to feedback we received from this pilot to decide whether or not we bake this feature into our future bus purchases. All right, Lindsay, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you so very much. Some really awesome work. Um, uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, customers really like to have all of that automated information telling them about what's happening uh, in some of our digital technology. I would like to welcome Cardi Samaranian, who's the director of the Digital Ride with our customer technology team to talk about those digital screens and other amenities that we have at stops. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, as Lindsay said, my name is Cardi Subramanian and I work in the still relatively new uh, customer technology department at the MBTA. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a couple of initiatives that we have to deliver better uh, bus stop amenities. Um, and, and the reason digital screens are sort of called out as, uh, you know, in the title here is that um, in the public meetings that we've been doing for the past five plus years, uh, starting you know, with Focus 40 back in 2016, and then also um, in the early uh, public outreach that we did as part of the earlier stages of the Better Bus Project, uh, something that we heard from riders again and again was that the bus stop amenity that they said would uh, help them take the bus more often uh, was real-time information. Um, and the way we deliver real-time information at bus stops uh, is through digital screens. Uh, next slide. So the first uh, initiative that I wanna tell you a little bit about is um, our attempt to put solar powered electronic ink screens at bus stops. Um, as Catherine uh, mentioned, there are more than 7,600 bus stops in our network in more than 50 cities and towns. Um, and there's an unbelievable range of infrastructure conditions and overwhelmingly there is, not, uh, there is no power. Um, and so this is a, a, a hardware pilot. This is our attempt to test whether this relatively new form factor. So the screen itself is sort of uh, is an e-ink screen, which is the same technology in a Kindle e-reader. And it's powered by a solar panel at the top of the pole. Um, we put 18 of these uh, signs in six municipalities. Uh, and as you can see in the image there, they provide real-time information uh, uh, for that stop. Um, uh, during the pandemic, one of the things that we were able to do um, when the MBTA became the largest uh, transit agency in the country to release real-time crowding on local buses, um, we updated our software application that runs on these screens to deliver real-time crowding uh, sort of, you know, uh, at bus stops. Um, so up next here, this is still a pilot, but we're going to be expanding this pilot uh, from 18 signs. We're going to add about 20 more, hopefully this calendar year. Uh, we, we sort of partner with other departments to choose stops that have, uh, you know, sufficient solar coverage as well as sort of high ridership um, in, 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 you know, sort of span across the network. Um, and the other thing that we're going to be doing is making sort of big improvements to the software. So, so what we're trying to visualize here is that soon uh, the software on these screens is going to be updated such that it will dynamically deliver high priority service alerts in addition to the sort of more basic bus arrival times. Um, so stay tuned for more and feel free to reach out to us. Uh, as I said, this is still very much a pilot. And so if this is uh, you know, one that you get value from and want to give us feedback on, we would be extremely happy to hear um, any sort of feedback that you have. Uh, about this. Next slide. Um, so this is this is new. This is not just digital signage. Um, we are. Uh, uh, Eric sp spoke a little bit about the the new bus uh, the center running bus priority corridor on Columbus Ave. Um, so in addition to the corridor itself, we have these eight new shelters that are you know, the, the the bus the. The bus infrastructure itself is kind of gold standard. We've also made an attempt to have the bus shelters provide sort of gold standard amenities. So these new bus shelters are going to have uh, seating, fare vending machines, and much more. And one of the major things that you'll see here is these very large, hopefully very useful um, digital screens that will deliver real-time information. And we're gonna have built-in audio equivalents for those screens within the shelter. Um, so this, these are still under construction. I think we're, we're going live, I, I won't. I won't guess it when we're going live. That's not my, my uh, for me to say. Um, but these will go live very soon. Um, 
And what's, what's up next here is that we hope to deliver bus shelters like these uh, to other bus priority corridors uh, and digital signage like this to other high impact locations in the network. Um, so you should see many more screens like these coming in the next year. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, I wanna tell you about a, a, new, uh, a new program. It's called the Street Furniture Program. This is another attempt to deliver improved amenities at bus stops. So we have a new partnership with a company called Intersection. And the reason we're really excited about this is because it's a very innovative contract vehicle that the MBTA has put together uh, to deliver both rider amenities. Uh, so you're looking here, there's an image of a, a kiosk for, that's sort of in Los Angeles. And on the right, you're looking at a bus shelter from Philadelphia. So we have the opportunity to deliver a variety of different amenities, including real-time information, including improved snow removal, and to do it while also raising uh, own source revenue, which uh, as many of you know, we have sort of mandate to do. The other thing that's really innovative about this contract is it, that it creates a co-investment opportunity. So uh, we can partner with municipalities, we can provide our capital funds, municipalities can provide theirs, and we can collectively try and expand the reach of this new uh, program. So coming up next, what you can expect uh, uh, this winter is the installation of the first two kiosks that will have real-time information on them. Um, and starting in 22, 2022 and beyond, you can expect many more of the shelters as well as brand new bus shelters like the one you are seeing on the right. Um, that's all for me. I think I'm the last trip of the day. So uh, back to you, Lindsay. Thank you again. Thank you so much. I want to commend the MBTA team that kept nine presentations in one hour on a variety of topics. And so we are now going to shift to our uh, breakout rooms. Um, we want you to imagine this like a virtual open house where our staff is there in the room to answer, answer your questions about any one of these bus initiatives. Once we open the breakout rooms, you'll be able to select the room that you would like to join. You will see that they're all labeled um, with the topics you heard about this evening. To join a room, you're going to simply select the join button uh, next to the room of your interest. The breakout sessions are going to last for 20 minutes. Um, and uh, as a reminder, since there are so many people on this call, 130 of you strong have stayed with us. Um, we are um, going to ask you all to limit your comments or questions to only one minute in length so that we can make sure that everyone has a chance to be heard. Um, during your breakout room, I would ask you to please use the raise hand feature um, and, and in order to make a comment just so our um, staff can make sure it's orderly um, and people aren't talking over each other. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. And at this point in time, I'm going to ask our admin um, to help move us to our breakout rooms.